Welcome and hello. This is a video tutorial in HECRAS. And in this lesson, I'm going to be talking about running a 2D flow model. All right, what you see on the screen here is the 2D user's manual for HECRAS. And this first page talks about running a 2D model. If you go ahead and expand this page a little bit uh, sideways, then you get this left menu. So we're going to be talking about all these individual pages as well, all the contents here in this video. This page here, I'll leave a link in the description of this video. Let's go ahead and get started. Here's my RAS mapper. As you see, I already have a simple model sketched out with a terrain layer in the background, a river center line, bank lines, flow lines, and then cross sections in a 2D flow area with a upstream and downstream boundary condition on that 2D flow area. I'm not going to go through all the details of the model. What we're going to talk about is going up to run unsteady flow analysis and then running this 2D model using this unsteady flow analysis. This interface may look familiar if you've watched any of the lessons or exercises that deal with the unsteady flow 1D models. The 2D unsteady flow models use the exact same interface. Because they are linked, they use the same interface as the 1D. 1D and 2D are linked on a time step by time step basis, and this makes the computations a little bit easier. Oftentimes, it switches between 1D and 2D based on some of the options that you can do under options, computation, settings, and tolerances, and then 1D slash 2D. If you go ahead and change this number from 0 up to either 1 through 20, then uh, the 1D and 2D routine works at the same time. So basically, what you do is open up this unsteady flow analysis, fill out all the form fields that are required, then click the compute button and then you're done. So we're gonna talk about this interface as well as some of the options. So here we go, let's start off. When you first open this interface, you'll probably have a plan. It'll be blank here, and then you'll be prompted to save the plan once you save the project or try to run it or something. You can create a new plan by going file, new plan, open an existing plan, save your plan, save your plan as a new file name and so on. Other requirements include a geometry file and an unsteady flow file. I already have these files defined, but you need to go ahead and make that selection. And then over here in the programs to run, uh, they'll start unchecked, but I check them on because I want to run my geometry preprocessor. This basically computes the hydraulic property tables for each cell or each cross section, depending on if you're doing a 1D model or a 2D model. And that will compute the flow versus elevation, the velocity versus elevation, hydraulic radius, wetted perimeter, all those parameters. All right, uh, the next checkbox I want to run as well, this is the programs to run unsteady flow simulation. This is the actual compute routine to run the simulation. Indented below that is a sediment. We'll go ahead and check that on if this happened to be a sediment simulation. And then post processor, this checkbox will write the results to a file after the actual execution has taken place. And then finally, the floodplain mapping checkbox. This is used for computing an inundation map for the CWMS program or the HECWAT program. But we can view the static flood maps just in HECRAS, so we're going to leave this one unchecked. Below that, I have simulation time window, so I need to specify the start and end date time of the simulation. What I've done is just set it to the first day of the year, so just the 24-hour duration for this simulation. And this happens to coincide with the boundary conditions that I've set in my unsteady flow file right up here. So some of these topics I've already covered in depth. For instance, geometry preprocessor, I covered in lesson 26 called geometry preprocessor. And then the rest of this user interface, excluding geometry preprocessor, I covered in lesson 27. That's called uh, user interface. And then in lessons 28 through 30, I covered all of the options that you see here for this unsteady flow simulation. So we were talking about it in 1D earlier on in those earlier lessons, 28 through 30. All of the same material applies to uh, the 2D flow as well. All right, but this is lesson 85, and I'm going to focus really on the 2D and the 1D slash 2D differences and things that haven't already been discussed in this lesson. There's really three methods, or the user manual says three, but there's really four methods for computing the flow across a 2D uh, mesh. To do that, we'll go up to options and compute options and tolerances. We're going to check out what those uh, so 
equation sets are. So here is the options and tolerances dialog box. I'm going to go ahead and select 2D flow options, which is this second tab right here. And then down here on row 10, equation set, the default equation set is diffusion wave, EW. But then we have three other methods here. SWE stands for shallow water. So the other three methods are all related to shallow water. There's ELM, EM, and LIA. The user manual talks about what these acronyms mean and then uh, the differences between them all. But I'm going to go ahead and just sort of wave my hand at the details and just mention a few of the more pertinent differences between these methods. The user manual mentions that a typical workflow would be to get your 2D flow model up and running using Diffusion Wave, which is a little bit more hardy and implicit as far as solving calculations. Doesn't uh, rely on momentum or inertia as much as the SWE methods. And then once you get the model up and running and it's stable, go ahead and try the shallow water equation methods and then compare the results. If there is a difference, you probably want to go with the shallow water equation method it's most likely to be a little bit more accurate, although likely to be a little bit harder to actually calibrate and reach stability. The shallow water equations, SWE, these equation sets are probably more appropriate when your model has highly dynamic flood waves, abrupt contractions or expansions, tidally influenced conditions, detailed water surface elevations at structures, or mixed flow regimes. So basically, the more complicated, the better. But diffusion wave is better for the opposite reason. When you have the opposite situa situation is true where the water is not changing too much. You don't have a highly dynamic flood waves, no tidal influence, and so on. For a comparison between diffusion wave model and shallow water equations, I have this table right here. So it compares the governing equations, whether or not inertia is used flow conditions, application, and computational demand. So shallow water equations are a little bit more intense and a little bit more precise and a little bit less stable. So diffusion wave, for instance, neglects inertia. It's best for subcritical, slow-moving, predictable flow, whereas the shallow water equations are better for handling subcritical flow and then also structures. But the trade-off is that it requires more computation and is less stable. The 2D flow area mesh cell size is also a factor when trying to reach the stability. So let me go to RAS Mapper, close this. I'm going to turn off the background terrain layer so we, now we can see the 2D mesh a little bit better. And then I'm also going to toggle on the computation points. There we go. If the water surface in your model or the flow rate or the velocity is changing too quickly between cells, then we may need to use a modify the cell size depending on the situation. And RAS Mapper allows the user to change the locations of the computation points, add or remove computation points, as well as add break lines and refinement regions. The geometric data editor allows for these things as well, at least modifying the computation points. So that will allow you to modify your model to hopefully more easily attain stability. Also, these individual cells are showing to typically have four or five sides. But in HECRAS, you can have up to eight separate sides or neighbors for each individual cell. Stability typically comes when the current number is small. So what I mean by that is, let me get the, uh, the equation up on the screen here. Here's the current number definition, which is the velocity time interval divided by the dx, which is the distance across the cell. Or in a 1D model, it'd be the distance between two cross sections. But di distance between two cell centers, I should say, is the dx. The shallow water equation, EM, uses explicit solution scheme for, having, for solving the equations. And that's why the current number is, must strictly be less than 1, this c sub r value. However, when using the SWE ELM method, the current number should be below 3. And then using diffusion wave method, the current number here must be below 5. I've got different sources on that current number between max of 2 and 5 for diffusion wave. Generally speaking, the lower the current number, the better and the more stable. 
What we don't want is a particle of water that's crossing multiple cells in the same time step. So that's basically what this equation is getting at. The current number is the number of cells that a particle of water crosses in uh, one single time step. So we want that number below one typically. Ways to lower the current number obviously would be to lower the numerators, the velocity or the time period, the time interval, or to increase the dx, which is increase the cell spacing. The diffusion wave equation has a, allows for a higher current number and may probably be more stable. And that's because it's less sensitive to inertia and momentum and why you should probably start with the diffusion wave model as you're trying to get your model up and running and working correctly. As far as the current number goes, I went ahead and uh, created a table for that. Diffusion wave can exceed up uh, two to five for that current number. It's more stable, the computation is faster, and it's uh, recommended for a larger flood plain. So there's a, a little bit of overlap between those two tables. So when you're solving for the time step, this DT value right here, where this comes up is if you go to run and then hydro, sorry, then steady flow. And now we have our computation interval right here. It's currently set to one minute. This is the default setting. And then don't be confused by these other time values like hydro graph output interval, uh, mapping output interval and detailed output interval. These are all set to one hour by default. You can all change these as well, but these are these other three are really more for writing the results of the simulation to a file. But as far as that current number calculation and what's typically referred to as the computation time step, it's this value here, the computation interval, which is uh, default to one minute. So how do you know what it should be? How do you know that it should be one minute? Well, what you may do for uh, one approach to this is find on your map where you have the highest velocities and the smallest dx values. These would be the most critical cells in the mesh. These would be the cells that sort of govern that dt value. They would set a ceiling on the dt. So your, your dt would have to be um, at most the value in this equation right here. So I got a quick example here. Say you're using the diffusion wave method. So that allows for a current number as high as five. So we'll say CR is five. And then we'll say that the peak velocity in the model is 10 feet per second. So V is feet per second. Now we're solving for DT or delta T here. And then if the DX right here is cell size, we'll say is 200 feet. Then the 200 feet times the five over here is a thousand feet divided by 10 feet per second leaves us with uh, 100 seconds. So 100 seconds in that simple example I gave you would be the maximum DT or delta T. So if I go ahead and return to the, here we go, unsteady flow, 100 seconds is a minute 40. So one minute would be sufficient, but it would be safe in that situation to decrease that computation time interval to something as, well, as small as 0.1 seconds. I didn't realize it went down that far. So that's a, that'd be a safe bet. But keep in mind that the smaller the computation interval, the more computations. And for large models, this could really bring up the computation time. So you don't want to be doing that too much. It's kind of a trade-off between how accurate and stable you want your model versus how long you want for the simulation to run. There's also a variable time step cap capability built into HECRAS. So right now we're talking about it being a constant time interval for the entire simulation, this entire 24 hours, one minute. However, that can change. If I go up to the options menu and then computation options and tolerances, and then this penultimate tab, advanced time step controls, this gives us the ability to either use the fixed time step. That's what we're using already because that's what's checked. And then the other two radio buttons here is adjust time step based on the current number. And then the last one here is adjust time step based on time series divisors. So the current number allows you to set a minimum and maximum current number. And for instance, if the current number for a time step exceeds this maximum, then the DT value will half and it'll con continue having and having until the uh, certain uh, limit is reached. And then just the opposite is true if the current number dips below uh, the minimum here, then the DT will double as number as many times as specified. Down below here, adjust the time step based on the time series divisors. This is where you can change the number of divisors 
for a different time range. So I'm not going to go into this too much. I did a full example on this and talked about the current number in exercise 25. I'll go ahead and leave a link to that in the description of the video if you want to see uh, this tab and an example of it in action. All right, so I'll go ahead and close that. Last, we're ready to compute. So once everything is all filled out, we'll go ahead and click the compute button. Wait for this to run. Okay, that finished up. Right here, we have computation messages. So if I wanted to read any of the messages that were printed out during the computation, there's that. If I close this window and I want to bring up those notes again, I can go view runtime messages. Here are those same messages right here. Also, there was another option I already had checked on, check data before execution. I like to do that. So it runs a quick data check to make sure it has all the information it needs prior to actually running the compute. And if it doesn't, it'll send you a message and tell you what's missing. And then we also have this view computation log file. So if I click that on, we have additional data. This isn't the same thing as the DSS files and the results. That'll be it for another lesson. But uh, what I am seeing is a little bit of information for the results here printed out in a log format. So this is good for debugging. Now, if you wanted more information than you saw there, you can go up to options, output options, and then click on this detailed log output. And then you can go ahead and click on all these checkboxes, click OK, run the compute again. And then next time we'll show you just how much data gets output to that log file. Okay, so that finished up. I'll click close. Now let's go options, view computation log file. And this time we should have a lot more data. Okay, so it just, it finally loaded. Here's the information. And this is for a very simple 24 hour simulation. All right, so the very last thing here, if you go up to view, I know these are results and I'm sort of starting on the results lesson, but if you wanted to see the unsteady flow spatial plot or unsteady flow time series plot, Right now it's grayed out, but to get those active and accessible from your simulation, they can be toggled on as well. If you go to options, output options right here, and then let me go detailed log. I'm going to go ahead and turn these off and then go to the next tab over computation level uh, output options. I'm going to go ahead and just check this on, not specify a time or date. So it's the entire simulation. And then let me just go ahead and add a few variables, click OK. Compute it one final time. Okay, click close. Now, if I go up to view, I can now view the unsteady flow spatial plot and unsteady flow time series. And if I do that, I now have the variables that I toggled on here. All right, well, that's it for this lesson. What we talked about was running a 2D flow model in HECRAS. We went up to run and then unsteady flow analysis. And we talked about this interface and some of the data inputs that are required for running the simulation.